House for the second installment in the Star Center's International Security Speaker Study Series. Uh, say that fast five times. Um, anyway, I'm uh, privileged to introduce my longtime friend and colleague Dan Twining, who's going to be our speaker today. Uh, Dan is currently a senior fellow for Asia with the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, which I, hopefully most of you are familiar with GMF, but if not, it's uh, one of the premier uh, entrepreneurial public policy and foreign policy organizations in, uh, in the world today, I think. Um, and Dan has been a real pioneer with the Asia programs. Uh, before that, he comes to us with uh, a, over a decade of uh, policy-making experience. He was uh, Senator McCain's national security advisor for a number of years, worked on the State Department policy planning staff, and also the uh, U.S. Trade Representative's office. Uh, he holds a doctorate in international relations from Oxford and is widely published in popular and academic outlets. So he's going to be talking to us today on uh, implications uh, of Asia's rise for the global liberal, liberal order. And uh, Dan will talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and after that we'll have, uh, have time for some, some Q&A and a, and a uh, vigorous and respectful exchange of ideas. <laughs> One of the housekeeping <laughs> items is, uh, as you know, we have a full calendar with the Strauss Center this, uh, this fall, and our next talk will be Josh Rodner talking on intelligence reform on October 11th. So keep an eye on your email inboxes for, for news on that. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan. So, thanks. Okay. Will, thanks. I can't, I can't decide if I'm going to gravitate to the lectern or do the kind of talk show host phenomenon here. So um, thank you for having me. Will is actually a non-resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund, uh, a, an old friend and colleague of ours. And when he says I'm widely published, it's partly because he edits shadow government on the foreign policy website. So uh, thank you for that. I hope you're signing a lot of that to your students here. Um, <laughs> well, my students get too much in voting. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, thank you to all of you, Frank, everybody, for the hospitality that you've shown me. Um, really delighted to be here. It's, it's a great treat for uh, all of us who are based in Washington to leave Washington often. Um, and that means not just going to Asia and Europe and, and elsewhere, but actually coming kind of out into the country. Um, and I don't know if you all count as real people, because Washington and it doesn't have many of them. Um, but I do get the sense that, that there is a very vigorous and active debate here um, and, and a lot of really good thinking going on. Uh, not just among the faculty, but among the students and wider community about these big macro questions in this uh, very rapidly changing world that we live in. And, and I'm going to try to do kind of a slightly macro thing for you, which is just take kind of a long look, um, a, a big picture look at what the rise of Asia means for liberal order. And, and because I'm being hosted here by a public policy institute, I'm going to try to do this in sort of a slightly non-academic way. There's a way to do this quite academically. Um, it's probably more interesting uh, to, to do it in a more down-to-earth way. Uh, but I don't know how you could do that in a macro conversation. Anyway, you see my point. I'm going to try to do 30,000 feet down-to-earth. Um, and I'm going to start by just, just putting a few cards on the table. Um, the first is my understanding, uh, and it's, it's not mine. It's, it's the understanding of many great scholars about the sources of international order. Um, and, and this sort of my starting point is that it's really primary powers that produce and organize uh, the international order that we live in at a given time. International society has many components, uh, a set of norms uh, that underpin it, a set of power relationships. Um, but a lot of these are actually derivative of the role of a primary power and its friends and allies within the system. Uh, primary powers frame the international rules of the game around their interests and values. Uh, they, they generate a, a, a kind of uh, uh, a context, uh, a, a substance to the international system uh, that reflects their identities and their beliefs about themselves and, and their role in the world. I say all of this, I mean, it, it's sort of obvious, but I think a lot of us, I mean, particularly those of us who are young, I hope I still count as the young, sometimes forget uh, that there is this invisible infrastructure out there. We think a lot, you know, depending on what school of international relations you subscribe to or what you make about the latest news and the headlines. We tend to think about um, power trajectories of countries. We tend to think about uh, conflict and contestation in the international system. We spend a little less time thinking about this invisible infrastructure that actually produces the basic framework in which countries and peoples and NGOs and others, international institutions operate. Um, this is an invisible infrastructure that, that uh, in the US case, in the case of this system that we and our friends have produced in the world, uh, uh, includes uh, freedom of the commons, the maritime commons, uh, space, et cetera. Uh, 
uh, the kind of extended deterrence commitments that the US makes to our friends and allies that are invisible. They're not in the headlines particularly. Um, but the world looks like a very different place if our commitments to our friends in Europe and Asia and the Middle East were to disappear. Um, the liberal institutions that exist in the world, uh, from the Security Council to the World Trade Organization, uh, to all of the different uh, uh, institutions uh, out there, uh, a lot of these are, are derivative of American power and beliefs. John Eikenberry and many others have written about this. So I just, wanted to, I just wanted to shine a spotlight on this invisible infrastructure um, because if it were to disappear or transform in content, uh, that would rapidly change the world we live in. And that's a more fundamental statement than simply trying to map different countries' GDP trends and this sort of thing. It's about something much deeper. Um, so the US built with our friends this liberal international order basically after World War II, uh, conceptualized it in part during the war. Uh, built it with our friends after the war, in the early Cold War years. And this was an order that was not global, right? This was an order that included Western Europe, it included Japan, it included outposts like Australia. Um, but in fact, there were several spheres in the world from 1945 until 1989. Uh, and one of them was this vast Soviet sphere. And one way to think about what has been happening in the world since 1989 in terms of the rise of the rest is to think about this liberal order that we and our friends produced and gave content to after, from the 1940s, this liberal order basically going global. Um, because in, I mean, this is fundamentally what has happened. So the liberal order that we built around our friends and allies and interests uh, in, our, in our sphere uh, has, has gone global. And the question then becomes, well, um, perhaps one would have thought once upon a time that that actually reinforced US primacy and leadership. I mean, there was a lot of talk about this, right, in the early 2000s, in the 90s, and in the 2000s. Um, that in theory, um, the globalization of this US-dominated system, this liberal order, should in theory have reinforced rather than undermined our primacy. Uh, I, the pendulum has now swung to the other extreme, in which I think it's often conventional wisdom that uh, this globalization of liberal order is actually undermining our leadership by producing this rise of the rest and these tectonic shifts that we've seen, not just around China, but really around the world uh, uh, over the last 20 years. So the second thing I'd like to do is give you a slightly contrarian perspective on the new multipolarity, if you want to call it that. I hesitate to use the term because the US is quite dominant across really a spectrum of comprehensive national power criteria. So, uh, we can talk about all this when we open it up. I wouldn't talk ourselves into believing that the world is actually fundam fundamentally multipolar today. The Chinese have this description, one superpower, many great powers. Um, uh, Henry Kissinger would talk about being primus inter pares. I mean, there are different ways to skin this cat. Um, but if we do accept that there are multiple power centers in the world, that we're still the, the leading one, but that there are many others, um, here's a contrarian view on how that has developed and what it means. Um, First is that, as I mentioned, we fought a world war and a cold war to live in a world of market democracies. Um, the good news is that we now actually do, with a big exception, which is China, a few small exceptions, China being the big exception. Um, and so the idea that the rise of all of these market democracies and their success around the world, in really every region of the world, you think about Brazil and Mexico and Latin America, you think about the Gulf states, uh, Turkey, you think about uh, countries like South Korea, Indonesia, India that are doing very well. The idea that the rise of market democracies around the world is somehow bad news for the United States, um, I find slightly contorted in, in logic. Um, in fact, I would argue this is the kind of world that we spent generations trying to build and live in. Uh, this is quite an interesting world. The BRICS story is quite familiar. The China story is quite familiar. There's a much more interesting story, perhaps, than simply the BRICS story. Um, Will and I work with the National Intelligence Council, which commissioned this very interesting study showing that two-thirds of global growth since 1989 has not been produced by the BRICS uh, or the developed world. It's been produced by these emerging middle powers, right? The Koreas, uh, the Indonesias, the Mexicos, uh, the Turkeys, etc. And so there is this wider diffusion of power, of economic power and, and political and diplomatic and military power that follow. There's this wider diffusion in the world, and it's a very different story from um, the idea that power is somehow slipping away from us in the West and reconcentrating itself elsewhere. Uh, it's certainly slipping away in, in parts of Europe and, and elsewhere. 
but it's really a more interesting story than that. This story of our time in terms of power and its trajectories and uses is very much about this diffusion of power, one that in theory, I think we can make a pretty strong case, should actually make the international system more stable, um, more balanced, uh, something that's underpinned by really regional centers of strength and prosperity in every region. You think about how well Latin America has done, the Gulf states, the, the Middle East, and liberalization there, uh, certainly all of Asia, wider Asia. Um, this is a kind of world that we should not be worried or fearful about living in. If you look at the old policy planning documents and the NSC documents from the, the mid to late 40s, the great worry of many American strategists, George Kennan and others, was the weakness of our friends and allies in the world. And there were these very existential questions that we asked at the highest levels of our system, you know, President Truman and company. Can we, with these weak allies in Western Europe and Japan that have been devastated by this world war, can we really compete against Soviet power, which was really seen as ascendant then? Um, can we really manage to, to take on this burden alone with these lesser subordinate allies uh, who have been hollowed out, whose capabilities really hollowed out by the war. So we now, in theory, are entering a world where we have the opposite problem, which is that we have quite a lot of strong allies and partners, countries that are doing quite well. Um, and that includes not just our traditional friends, you know, in Japan and South Korea and places. Uh, it includes new friends like India, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, etc. So if you were to ask, kind of a blank slate, if you were to ask a, a, a policy planner or a strategist, which problem would you rather have? I would any day rather have the problem of having strong friends and allies rather than weak ones, right? So I think there's a lot to work with here from a US perspective. Um, the last thing I would say about this new multipolarity, a lot of us get very wrapped up with GDP numbers. And what's happening in China in particular, which I'll talk about more next, is extraordinary. I and mean, it's historic and important in a, in a really a fundamental sense in a way that's really more important than the rise of Germany and Japan, if you think about this as part of a kind of millennial story, 500 years of the West being dominant in the international system, giving way to an era of Asian resurgence. So this is a fundamentally important story. But GDP numbers don't particularly tell you the whole picture. In fact, they can be quite misleading. So there's very interesting research that's been done showing, for instance, that during Britain's imperial century, 1815 to 1915, Britain never had a GDP approaching that of China, right? China was weak then. Um, uh, China was in disarray, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, serious problems in terms of mobilizing Chinese power, serious <laughs> domestic problems. But Britain, uh, during this, this great period in the 19th century, when it was widely attributed to be you know, the, the preeminent power in the international system, was actually, for most of this period, about its third largest economy and its fourth largest military power. I mean, the numbers changed over time. Um, I don't think we're Britain. I think we have a much better hand to play. But the point is that if one looked at GDP numbers, even in, say, the 18, say in 1815 or in 1860, one still would have assumed that China would have been the system's dominant power. And of course, it was nothing, it was nothing like that. It was actually a victim of predation by weaker countries in GDP terms in Europe. So uh, that, that's just an aside saying um, GDP is important, but it's not conclusive. The third wide point I would like to make is about China. And everyone has an opinion on this, so I really look forward to, to mixing it up with you on this question and, and the implications. Um, because what I'm about to say does not reflect the conventional wisdom that we're all going to live in a Chinese world. Uh, Martin Jake wrote this wonderful book. He was a GMF fellow, When China Rules the World, and sketched up this very interesting and sort of dark and troubling picture of what the world would look like if China basically swapped places with us, if China replicated American power and American reach in the world, um, including the imposition of its own cultural norms and biases and this sort of thing. Um, I don't actually think we're going there. The, I mean, the future is, is going to be more complicated, but it's probably not going to be that linear. Um, and the starting point of that assessment is that um, it's this question of the diffusion of power. Power is not bleeding out of Washington and reconcentrating itself in Beijing, right? It's not zero sum. Uh, what's happening is this wider dispersion of power in the system, away from the West, in favor of Asia, but also in favor of Latin America and other regions. So power is dispersing. And uh, funnily enough, it's reconcentrating in Asia. That's true. Um, but it's reconcentrating in Asia, not simply in China, but of course in many of China's neighbors. And so if you're making a judgment about how the diffusion of power impacts on our leadership in the world, 
I think part of that judgment has to involve an assessment of how the power diffusion impacts on China's ambitions, right? And we can have a debate about what China's ambitions are, a conversation. Um, but the point is that power is not, the, the point, the basic point is that power is diffusing, it's concentrating in, in key parts of Asia, including China, um, but that China, really China's trajectory looks more complicated in, in, a, in an important way uh, in terms of what's happening in its region among, among its neighbors. Uh, China's trajectory looks more complicated than in a way ours does because, again, many of these countries are our friends and allies, partners of, of long standing in a way that they simply aren't for China. This, this trend, in my judgment, will actually facilitate our staying power in the region. We'll talk more about that in Asia. Um, now, China's an illiberal power, right? I mean, the, this is meant to be a talk about liberal order in the world. And China, you know, is, is emerging as a superpower, as the world's second most important power. <laughs> but it's illiberal. So China really dashes this vision of a world of market democracies, uh, that sort of thing. Um, China is illiberal not only by virtue of its regime, and this is an interesting point. I mean, China does have this tradition, which historians are much better versed in talking about, this tradition of the dominance of the state. I mean, really going back thousands of years of Chinese history, um, civil society did not ever develop in China the way it developed in the West. And so there are fundamental questions about, even if you had a, 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 a political transition in China, there is still this historical and cultural and political legacy of the dominance of the state in China, which is a fundamentally illiberal phenomenon, right, in, in the way that we define liberalism. Um, so China looks like it remains illiberal, um, even if there is some kind of political opening. The other point here is that um, a lot of loose talk about China really becoming the pace setter in Asia and the world, right? The Beijing consensus, this idea that countries in Asia and around the world looking to China, China's political economic model is one that's superior to ours in the West as we flail around these huge issues of debt and, and the fiscal mess that we're in. Um, and this is interesting because China, when you actually think about its own region, for instance, China doesn't look like a pace setter at all politically. China looks like an outlier, right? So you think about wider Asia now um, in 2011. Uh, you have democracies in Japan, Korea, Indonesia, across Southeast Asia, over to India. Um, you have authoritarian regimes in China, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, North Korea, right? So these are China's friends, maybe not its allies, um, with the exception of North Korea. Um, when you think about how countries line up just in terms of their political regimes, China doesn't look like a pace setter for anyone. Uh, it looks quite the contrary. Um, and I, I do think this has important implications for international security and the way we think about the future. Uh, the other phenomenon here, of course, is China's economic magnetism, which really has pulled its neighbors into its, I don't want to say its economic orbit, but has really helped make its, its neighbors prosperous and quite dependent on China in some respects. Um, the interesting thing here, though, again defying predictions and I think rather superficial assumptions, is that this has occurred over the last 20 years. As this has occurred, countries moving closer to China economically, they've actually moved closer to us and each other in security diplomatic terms. And so you're not seeing countries bandwagoning with China as a result of their economic ties to China. You're actually seeing countries hedging their bets, right, by playing this game of uh, benefiting from the China trade, the China market, but at the same time understanding that they don't want to submit their security, their autonomy, their freedom of maneuver, their freedom to choose their own relationships in the world to the writ of Beijing. Um, so this is quite interesting. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But it's also just worth pointing out when we think about this great Chinese future and all that follows from it, including the diminishment of America in the world, um, that China faces really quite serious speed bumps on the road to superpower status. President Bush famously asked Hu Jintao, what keeps you awake at night? They had quite a good chappy relationship. And who said uh, creating 25 million jobs a year? Um, Xi Jinping, when, he, when Vice President Biden last visited Beijing about a month ago, uh, said to Biden, you know, the U.S. is highly resilient and has this strong capacity to adapt. I'm pretty convinced that China's leaders are not 
as confident in their own country's resilience and capacity to adapt. Um, and, and you know what many of the issues are here. The geography of constraint, China has 14 neighbors who by and large fear it and want to balance against it. The security dilemmas that China's military modernization and economic growth have produced, uh, which have really exacerbated uh, some of its strategic dilemmas in Asia and more broadly. The diplomatic dilemmas associated with m all, really all Asian countries' desires not to let China dominate regional institutions. We've seen this in the East Asia Summit, uh, where countries uh, worried that this was going to be a closed kind of Sino-centric club when it first organized itself about five years ago, pulled in India, Australia, other powers, subsequently pulled us in, the Russians. Now you have a much more pluralistic body. We're seeing this replicated across Asian regional institutions. Um, uh, further Chinese speed bumps, the environmental decay and resource constraints that are so apparent when you visit China and you get away from the glitz of Shanghai and, and you see what goes on in the countryside in terms of poison waters and nine of the 10 most polluted cities in the world being in China, the long-term health effects of these things. Um, China's extraordinary ratio, extraordinarily low ratio of arable land to population, meaning that it has this vast chunk of the world's resources on only about 2% of its arable land, water, et cetera. Um, China's demographic decline, again, I think this is an increasingly familiar story that China, in the words of Nick Eberstadt, starts walking off a demographic cliff in about 2025 as this age structure balloons the dependency ratio in Chinese society as a result of the one-child policy, the rapid aging that it's produced, uh, the lack of young people coming up in the system relative to the bulging of this older cohort. China's rest of minorities in Tibet and Xinjiang, this is also quite interesting. China has done very well economically for the last 30 years. Resistance to Chinese rule in Xinjiang and Tibet has grown over that period, and, and really even over the last three, four years has become more acute. So um, making people a little richer, a little better off doesn't solve some of these fundamental problems. And it's a very interesting exercise to look at a map of China without Xinjiang and Tibet, which constitute about 60% of its territory. And suddenly China's an East Asian power. It's not a Central Asian power. It's not a South Asian power. Suddenly it no longer has a border with India, right? This is the world's biggest, most important border conflict. Um, that's not to say that these, these regions will secede. It's just to say that the rest of minority issue is something that acutely concerns China's leaders. Um, Finally, the last two, the limits of the Chinese economic model, right? China, I mean, clearly there's been a debate among China's leadership about how do you shift from this uh, high capital intensive mass manufacturing state industry led model of economic growth based on overinvestment in heavy industry, the guidance of the state in determining bank loans, this sort of thing, uh, the building of massive uh, residential properties that remain uninhabited. How do you shift from this model to an economic model that produces innovation, consumerism. The Chinese consumer is squeezed to the point where consumption is only about a third of GDP in China now, right? Um, how, do you, how do you move beyond the business of manufacturing cheap toys and exporting widgets to the West? I mean, you've seen wage prices in China grow 30, 40% over the last year. So a fundamental question about can China make this economic pivot or uh, without which it gets caught in this middle income trap. And then, I mean, the most important question of all, really, that, that is um, derivative of many of these, or who, whose resolution will determine many of these outcomes, is just the political straitjacket. There's also been this very interesting debate on political reform in China, led by Wen Jiabao, but, but really including a, an interesting cohort of senior members of the Communist Party, uh, questioning the logic, the political basis by which China can make this economic shift. Um, you know, the, the, how can China produce the next Steve Jobs when people can't use Google or Facebook, that kind of thing. Um, so the political straitjacket is fundamental here when we think about can China continue this linear uh, degree of growth. Just to finish on China, I mean, I think there are these big questions. What does China want? Does it want suzerainty in Asia but happy to leave the rest of the world to us? Does it want the G2 where we, the US and China, kind of sit at the top and make the rules? You remember the Spanish and the Portuguese signed the Treaty of Tordesillas, I think in the 16th century, where they literally drew a line down the world and said, you take this part, I'll take this part. Um, the world today is a bit different, but does China want something like that, metaphorically? Or does China want to replicate our position? Does China look at the US, the dominant US role in the world and think, well, we'd like that. You know, We'd like troops in 100 countries. We'd like a global presence. Um, we'd like to control the maritime commons and others. Um, the interesting thing about any of these vectors is that there's no consent in Asia or the world for any of these options for China. Um, now, just very quickly, I'd like to just move to 
India, because this is the other quite interesting story that doesn't get enough attention. And it's fundamental. India's parallel rise is fundamental to any assessment about what Asia and the world can look like, and therefore what will constitute global order as we go forward. Um, China's always had this special place in the American imagination. You remember the missionaries in the 19th century and this idea of transforming China in our image. India captured this uh, in many respects among the US policy community in the 2000s. This idea of India is this rising demographic, dem democratic giant. Uh, this idea of India as being uh, this great ballast in Asia in terms of the growth of Indian capabilities. Uh, India, this is not you know, the Philippines or Thailand. I mean, India is the behemoth, right? It's going to have the world's largest population starting in about 10 years. Projections are that it has the world's second or third largest GDP in 20, 25 years. So India is just in a different category. Um, we see this in kind of constructivist terms as an antidote to China's authoritarian otherness, India's democratic system, its amazing pluralism, really the most pluralistic country in the world. Uh, we even project ourselves onto India and see it as kind of a, a late 19th, early 20th century America, stretching its wings, building the blue water navy, um, thinking about what kind of role it wants to have in its wider region beyond South Asia, uh, thinking about its ambitions more globally. Uh, India is behind China. There's no questioning that. They started economic reforms almost 15 years later than the Chinese. They're at least that far behind. China was always historically a little bit richer, a little bit bigger. Um, so this isn't to say that India surpasses China, but it is to say that a lot of these trends I highlighted, I mean, the demographics, uh, some of these real drivers, again, these quiet drivers that we might not spend enough attention, pay, pay enough attention to. Increasingly, these trends favor India over China when you look out 10, 20 years. Um, and so it's very interesting. I have a friend who says 20 years ago I was telling everybody to study Mandarin. Now I'm telling them to study Hindi. Um, not everybody has bought into the Indian story, but many Indians have. There's this amazing politics of aspiration in India among the youth, this, this enormous youth demographic that's rising that looks at the world in a fundamentally different way than its parents did in terms of non-alignment and these old bureaucratic rigidities that, that are sort of tapering out. Um, when we think about India and this story and the possibility of India's success, we in kind of the US strategic community think, wow, this, this really changes the game in Asia and the world if India can be India and can rise successfully to this level of global prominence. It gives us all these amazing strategic <coughs> options we would otherwise lack. Um, and, and part of that judgment, well, it's premised on several things. One is that it's never going to be a formal ally of ours. But really, by being India, we talked about this a bit last night, by being India, that's good enough. Um, because of the, uh, the skepticism of China, uh, the Indian determination not to live in any kind of sinosphere, uh, India's great position along its own ocean, which carries most of the world's energy resources, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is quite interesting because in China, in Beijing, many strategists, senior officials, senior military officers never particularly took India seriously. And then something changed about five years ago. And what changed is that the US broke open this new relationship with India. And suddenly, we found the Chinese talking about India in a different way. I mean, academics have actually written about the discourse shift uh, in China around India. Um, uh, suddenly, India was elevated in China's strategic framework in a way that it hadn't previously been. And our Indian friends tell us that the nature of our relations, our India's relations with China, are actually fundamentally determined by the nature of India-US relations. Because the degree to which China takes us seriously as a power in Asia and the world is a function of how close we are with you. Uh, so the Chinese have recognized this. Uh, what are the implications of India's success for Asia? Um, the, we have to ask about this, not simply because that's India, India's region, but because this is the world's emerging center of wealth and power. And we have to care about it, just like we cared about the cockpit of great powers, Europe in the 19th century. Um, India can be deployed by other Asian states to offset China's influence, as we've seen all, all around the board uh, in terms of defense exercises, in terms of Asian regional institutions. Asian regional clubs can resist Sinocentricity with this, this Indian giant in the room. Japan's strategic future may hinge on this interesting connection it's building with India. Um, Japan has gone beyond its US alliance, which it cocooned in for really 50 years to sign a new defense partnership agreement, first with Australia and then with India. Uh, the biggest foreign direct investment in India's history is occurring at the hands of Japanese companies, building this vast industrial corridor, linking Delhi to Mumbai. 
Um, in many ways, India is the strategic and economic answer to many of Japan's woes. And we're just now on the US side inaugurating this US-Japan-India trilateral to actually build on this momentum in India-Japan relations. And again, Asia and the world become a different place if Japan really comes back strategically. Um, uh, India's success allows us to connect our friends in the region to kind of move beyond the old hub and spokes alliance model that we had during the Cold War. Um, to think about how do you build new networks, how do you network not just allies but partners like India, like Indonesia, like Vietnam. And then thinking about what Asia looks like. If India is successful, you're looking at a region that is not a Sinosphere, that's not some kind of new middle kingdom uh, in which countries pay tribute and deference to the Chinese in modern forms. You're looking at an, an Asia, really the center, the, the emerging center of wealth and power in the international system that is pluralistic rather than Sinocentric in which no country is preponderant, um, but in which the US still will have this very strong capacity to lead and shape and operate in and move in. Um, so we think that this will generate uh, quite a strong degree of staying power for us, irrespective of what kind of relationship really India has with us, just by virtue of being India. Um, we even, uh, silly people like me, have even written articles talking about an Indo-American century and saying that we're really getting this wrong about the Chinese century that we all envision which is that actually if we can sort of snap out of our rut, because there's this great demand still, uh, growing demand for US leadership in Asia particularly, as these tectonic shifts occur, as India ascends, uh, as we think about everything we can do together in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in this vast region that connects the world's great economies, um, in fact there are these extraordinary synergies between our two countries, India and the US, and there are even people in, in our system and currently in government, previously in government at very senior levels, including, I mean, I think former President Bush, who thought that really India 15, 20 years from now would be our most important partner in the world. Our allies never like hearing this. Um, but, but great expectations for this country. Um, just, to, just to move towards wrapping up, what are the implications for liberal order? Um, going back to this, this theme. Uh, the US and really I would argue all democracies in the West and Asia have a great stake in India's success. India's success, the success of emerging powers like Indonesia, will really shape China's own choices. They'll certainly create a certain kind of strategic environment about, around China uh, that will influence China's own decisions about foreign adventurism, how far afield it wants to go, how, it, how China goes abroad. Um, but I would argue that a region of strong democracies led by India will also shape China's internal debates about what kind of political order China moves to. Uh, China's very distinctive and is not going to ape anyone else's model. But it goes back to this point, which is that living uh, a China that is living in a, in a region of democracies is going to have a very different conversation about its own political framework than a China that re lives in a region of dictatorships. Um, our judgment is that when you think about, think about a world of great civilization states, right, China, India, us, the West, that we on the US side, leave the Europeans aside for a moment, that we can really thrive in this kind of world, actually. Um, and that's partly because there's this interesting question. If you think about India, China, U.S. as a triangle, um, we think that our interests will converge with India's uh, such that the triangle will always have two legs and will be a part of that, that dominant leg. Um, but part of the confusion here is the fact that India lies in Asia. And so people tend to think of it as an Asian power. And again, going back to these GDP statistics, uh, Commentators often note, well, gosh, you know, Asia is going to have 60% of the world's GDP. Uh, but of course, that, that GDP is not going to be concentrated at the hands of any one country. It's going to be dispersed among countries. And in fact, is it even right to think about India as a purely Asian power? Raja Mohan is really India's best strategist, in, in my view, um, really their leading strategic thinker. And he wrote a very interesting article that we commissioned at GMF arguing that India should not be thought of as an Asian power. India actually should be thought of as more of a Western power because of its enlightenment tradition, because of this transformational debate it's had about its foreign policy choices over the last five years, and this idea that really its most important relationships in the world now are, are in the West uh, rather than in its region, uh, and that, that we should actually think about India, um, maybe if you don't like it, as India as a Western power, Sunil Kalnani talks about India as a bridging power between East and West. But it's a friendly bridge, right? It's not a bridge that's going to swing one way or another over the long term in our view. Um, we think about a liberal order in the world in which India is successful, in which we remain resilient, in which ideally Europe comes back, Japan comes back. Uh, 
um, in which democracy, not autocracy, is a framework for peace, in which norms of horizontal sovereignty continue to apply, rather than more hierarchical relations of domination and subservience. Just to finish, um, what are the challenges to this vision? This sounds like a rather optimistic vision. I'll name four, and you can tell me, I'm sure, many more. Um, the first is this interesting magnetism that you have between Washington and, Washington and Beijing. I mean, we saw this with, with Kissinger and Nixon, this idea of building world, really the world's most privileged relationship, the US's most privileged relationship with China. In the 70s, we were sharing intelligence with China in the 70s that we didn't share with any country, with any of our allies. We were providing quite sophisticated technologies and defense components to China in the 80s. Um, we've seen this G2 dynamic go up and down. It reemerged in the first year of President Obama's administration when there really was this active conversation about a G2 and serious people in our foreign policy establishment like Zvig Brzezinski called for such a G2. Um, there's this interesting phenomenon when as a US policymaker goes to Beijing and sits down with Chinese colleagues, you can have these global conversations about every region of the world, about grand strategy, about very quite sophisticated strategic issues that we on the US side now struggle to have even with our closest allies, right, in, in Europe, in Japan. And so there's this temptation. I mean, we, ha we saw this during the Soviet years, too, with detente. There is this temptation to sit down with the Chinese as kind of the rising superpower. Um, and rather than worry about containing them and building coalitions to constrain them, uh, we're actually quite drawn together by this vision of um, superpower partnership, if you will. Um, so I, I think this is quite dangerous and we need to resist it, primarily because our friends and allies in the world don't like this vision at all. But this superpower magnetism exists. The second challenge are the big questions around India, and there are many. Can India become a shaping power? Can it rise above its tumultuous politics, uh, its societal hurdles, and really play this kind of role that we envision for it? And I think if you think it can't, you have to make a pretty strong case uh, about why uh, countries across Asia could modernize at these, these rates that China most lately has modernized at. Um, why India would somehow be exceptional in this regard. Japan did it, Korea did it, Taiwan did it, China is now doing it, Vietnam is now doing it. What's different about India uh, that means that India basically can't rise, can't match these GDP growth figures over time? The Indians have this wonderful line, you know, China grows because of the state, India grows in spite of the state. Um, which is largely true. I mean, India, very, very much private sector-driven growth. You know, no big state-owned industries turn a profit, that sort of thing. If India can grow at 8 or 9% with this rather useless bureaucracy, this, um, this, this state that really imposes a lot of red tape on the economy, imagine if that state could reform itself. As the American state reformed itself in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, as, as countries tend to do, imagine if you could actually get good governance in India over time and what that would do given these underlying demographic and other trends. The third challenge, can the US learn to work with a country like India, a strong independent power that's really our equal, that's not subservient, right? We're used to working with weak allies uh, in Japan and Europe uh, in, in the Cold War period and, and since. Can we actually get used to this idea of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship that's, that's friendly and like-minded? And that's a big question for us. Um, we haven't fully gotten our arms around this. And finally, the biggest question in the room, the elephant in the room, and I left it to last, um, can the U.S. put our own house in order to be able to lead? Um, there is this great demand for our leadership in Asia and the world. Countries worry not, they used to worry about America being too heavy-handed, right, 10 years ago. If only we still had that problem. Um, they now worry about us walking away, about diminishing our commitments. They're watching this debate around Afghanistan, around defense spending. President Obama just proposed a trillion dollars of cuts to defense over the next 10 years. Um, countries are watching our domestic debates about debt and spending uh, with the greatest interest and concern um, because, going back to my original point, this entire order that we all live in, uh, having been constructed by us and our friends, uh, begins to wither away if we cannot meet the basic commitments to provide these invisible goods, this invisible infrastructure that, that underlies it and that, interestingly, has probably been the greatest source of Chinese wealth and success over the last 30 years. Thank you. I used to work for John McCain, who always said questions, comments, or insults. So any, any of the above. Yes, sir. One, one thing you didn't touch on, you talk about demographics, which is apply both to uh, China and India, is the ratio of male to female. 
uh, very skewed towards the male, which produces a lot of young males that can't get married. Uh, and among, uh, including those who can't find jobs, uh, a very restive population in both cases. How do you see this impacting on the future? This is a big problem. There's already this very interesting, um, in Korea, among other places, there's this very interesting business in mail order brides, right? Mm -hmm. And you, it's sort of hard to imagine that may work in Korea. But that doesn't work in a country of 1.3, 1.4 billion people. There just aren't enough mail order brides from the Philippines and elsewhere, Vietnam. Um, sorry, I'm not, I'm, I don't mean to josh about it, because actually the, the whole thing is slightly troubling. Um, so it's, it's a fundamental question. It is part of this demographic story, and it is something that should worry China's leaders very much, is this society suddenly looks so imbalanced, not only in terms of dependency ratio, but in terms of male to female ratio. And what does this mean for, uh, uh, Chinese adventurism, you've got, what, 20, 30 million guys who aren't going to have a wife, who don't have prospects in life, the kind of prospects that really people everywhere aspire to, a home, a family, children. Um, where, where is the outlet for these energies? And um, if China had a liberal political system, I would think, well, gosh, maybe they could run for Congress or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> dream maybe, or you know, participate in civil society or that sort of thing. But so the answer is no. I mean, there, this, this encourages the kind of foreign adventurism that we all fear and creates these terrible pressures on the system. Yes? Yeah, we have to work on this. I mean, this is the worry about our domestic debate now, is that it's all about us. And at some point, we need to make this debate partly about our interests, our friends, our wider commitments. Because as you say, it's, it's, it's about a lot more than simply us. Um, the US fleet is close to the size that it was in World War I, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, obviously, it has different capabilities than existed 100 years ago. Um, I read in the paper the other day, so these aren't particularly classified numbers, and I'll see if I can remember correctly, that in the Western Pacific, the US has 18 submarines, and China has 52 now. Um, so I mean, these things are more than a numbers game. But, but to the extent that numbers shape perceptions, they matter fundamentally. And so part of why, I mean, part of the assessment of why so many Asian countries are saying, why don't you come and you know maybe station, station uh, some a permanent ship presence here, some permanent facilities here for refueling. I'm just back from Australia where they're having a very interesting debate about hosting American forces in Northwest Australia, which is something quite new. Uh, there is this demand. Uh, countries are trying to remind us that they need us to be here, and they're trying to facilitate that, watching our domestic debate. Uh, and so that's quite encouraging. The question is, are we going to hear the message and do the right thing? Yes. I'm trying to understand. 
That's an interesting question, and there are several answers. I mean, the, the first thing to say, as you know, is that we've had this retrenchment debate before. I mean, after various world wars, after Vietnam, it was a very interesting debate in the late 80s, early 90s. The Soviet power collapsed. Would the U.S. come home from Asia? And the great fear at the time, as you remember, was that Japan would fill the vacuum I and mean, how the world changes. <coughs> so in a way, it's quite interesting, because in Asia, we've been through this exercise before. It was only 20 years ago. And there was this great body of literature and kind of narrative around these very questions. And the scenarios were slightly troubling. Um, <coughs> I mean, part of this just depends on your philosophical disposition. If you think, say, that India and Japan would balance, that the US could do offshore balancing, whether this works as a long-term strategy. Um, I mean, my interpretation of American history since World War II is that we concluded grand strategy. That offshore balancing didn't work, right? It didn't. You know, we've been in Europe since 1945, well, since 1941, uh, permanently. We've been in Korea, Japan uh, for 60 years. Um, and the fear was always that if we left, we would simply be sucked back in. So the, the dark view of offshore balancing in Asia is that you leave. And by leaving, you set off this chain of events that only pull you back in in a much less favorable environment. And there are also basic questions about I think countries like India and Japan, I think the questions are less true about India because of its bulk and its history. But with Japan, um, I mean, there is a scenario where Japan looks at the world. Maybe Taiwan is Chinese once again. We're gone. India is quite far away. And the Japanese say, well, gosh, we have to do a deal with Beijing. There's literally not a strategic option for us to do this by ourselves. Um, so I don't think you want to put your friends into the position of even having to have that debate, I would argue. Um, if we weren't, I mean, this would, be a, this would be a different conversation if we were not forward deployed in Asia, if we didn't have this alliance framework, if we were starting from scratch, looking at the China challenge, the regional challenge to our leadership. <coughs> would you reconstitute this alliance structure? Would you deploy 60,000 guys in Japan, et cetera, 40,000 guys in Korea? I mean, maybe the answer is no. Maybe you would do something different. Um, but given where we are, that we are here and there is widespread consent and, and legitimacy for our role in Asia, I would be reluctant to give that away. I, I don't know what one would gain from giving it away. Yes? Thank you for bringing it up, because I, I meant to mention this earlier, um, in terms of this retrenchment debate that we have every 20 years or so. Um, I mean, Tom Donilon talks about the US being overweight Middle East, underweight Asia. Uh, I, Gates made a bet before he left office as SecDef that in five years, we would have more of a presence and role in Asia than we do today. So I, I mean, I think this point is correct, that rather than retrenching and looking to walk away, we are building up. And that's going to involve some tough choices in terms of our presence in Europe, and what kind of weapons we build and spend our money on. Um, but of course, you're right. I mean, the, the fault, it's a false choice to talk about it being all or nothing, because there are various gradations. However, um, we had an interesting conversation last night about extended deterrence in Japan, because the Japanese actually do worry about our extended deterrence commitments, and have, you know, came to us a few years ago and said, you know, we're slightly worried about this eroding. And so uh, part of this is a question of, does this become a slippery slope? I mean, do perceptions really begin to shape policy to the point that countries start making their own choices? And to the extent that countries are making choices based on the idea that we are diminishing over time, um, even if that's not walking away, even if that's not withdrawing troops, uh, that still leads you to a different and more troubling place. So I, I would be willing to make a bet that you see a ramp up in Asia, even as you see a drawdown in, in many other parts of the world. Yes? So um, thank you for, for a really nice tour of kind of the whole region. It's been touching a lot of really big, moving parts. Very much like it. It's very exciting to think about this. Um, my question, and this just in my mind, is a very simple one. I want to know, I think the world is operating where countries have interests in how we're able 
Um, and the world that you laid out, I think, is very much along these lines. Um, but I think what it comes down to, basically, is where these interests come from, and what are the effects that these changes that you're observing now in that order that you're talking about, since it's a global order, how do those impact the interests of the countries involved? And do you see, I think the real sort of counterpoint and the challenge of your position might be one that says, state capitalism is taking feast, and here these countries have found that they can tap into the instrumental benefits that arise from these institutional or interest or domestic systems that enables this country to aggregate a lot of power without having the transformative effects on their own interests mm -hmm. and the way the states define what it is they want to do in the international system as a consequence of having a massive power to do something mm -hmm. about those interests. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to hear your perspective on is to what degree do you think some of these changes and dynamics that you're laying out uh, may or may not actually be altering the national interests of some of these players, including the United States, mm -hmm. in terms of the dynamics that you're laying out in the U.S. and how you see these particular regions mm -hmm. that you judge um, to be the Just a clarifying question. Um, I mean, where is state capitalism the dominant model outside of, say, China and Russia? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Because in the world that you propose, there's kind of good guys and bad guys. And this China side of the equation is potential bad guy, rather than the good guy and bad. Um, what I'm wondering is, does China change? And so is there not really a good guy and bad guy in the case of world dominance and power dynamics? It's an interesting question. I mean, there are subset questions that are quite useful, like is China's ability to mobilize domestic resources enhanced by its current regime type? Um, I mean, one would think the answer would be yes, given the strong hand of the state in the Chinese economy and Chinese society. But then you look at the fact that China has more people deployed for internal security than it does have in its entire armed forces, right? And you think, well, gosh, is that really the best use of resources to, to have a bigger internal security police than you do an army, a navy, and air force. Um, I mean, what are the what are the international relations implications of that? Um, I mean, perhaps there's a, an argument that could be made that as long as China has this political configuration, Chinese leaders continue to define the primary threats to national security as being internal, right? Their own people, the Tibetans, the Uyghurs, etc. Um, and that actually diverts China from going abroad uh, in a, in a fundamental way, uh, or diverts China from taking risky actions that could lead to conflict that in turn could create a feedback loop and weaken the regime's legitimacy or if it tried to stand up to Japan and was stood down or if it tried to retake Taiwan and failed. So my sense, I mean, you're a China guy, so I'd love to hear your answer to the question. My sense is that it is still true that if you ask Chinese leaders, what do you worry about in your heart of hearts in terms of national security, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with us or the Japanese or the Indians or the Taiwanese and everything to do with their people. Um, and so I, I don't think that's particularly good for us because it leads to all sorts of instabilities. But there is an argument that if China had a, a, a liberal political system that really worked um, in which the legitimacy of the regime was truly entrenched and kind of unquestioned, then it could actually pursue a much more creative and interesting foreign policy. And what would that look like? What, what do you think is the answer? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. No, I mean, it was all guesswork. Okay. There's not really a good answer that's out there. I think it's something that China wrestles with. And it's something that the rest of the world sort of anxiously watches and tries to try to improve this on. But I, I don't think China itself has figured out where it's going yet. And I think that they recognize that these forces need to be unleashed in some way. And they have very real legitimacy implications. Um, but what, what interests me is, is the Chinese population views the Chinese government as being very legitimate. And it has a lot of popular support. And for reason, they kind of make these assumptions. Right. In the West, we can look and say, oh, well, how can these guys even legitimately a big problem? It's not really a big problem. Right? Yeah. When you're you growing at 10, 11 percent, it's not, it's not a big problem when you're growing at 10 or 11 percent. Right. So the population generally thinks that Congress Party is going to take the country back. Right. It, it's kind of interesting. And it's these, like a lot of good questions, there's no good answer. I just kind of, I was curious to hear your right. thoughts on this. Just, Dan, if I can interject real quick and follow up this is my question. I think Vietnam's an interesting test case here because mm -hmm. they certainly don't align with the West on the value situation. They're not a liberal democracy. Uh, you know, ideologically, they'd be much more uh, aligned with China as another authoritarian capitalist power. And yet, as you know, they've been wanting to lean much more towards the uh, the Western side recently out of uh, some more, I think, you know, real politique concerns about uh, China's encroachment. So, I, I don't know, I'd be curious your thoughts on this. In some ways, just, uh, just another angle on Will's question. Vietnam's interesting in many respects. I mean, one of which is just that it goes back to kind of Mearsheimer and, you know, 
because they share a border, does Vietnam have the autonomy to do anything other than bandwagon with China? And the answer is the Vietnamese think they do. It's harder for them than it is for the Indians or the Indonesians or others. But they're still trying, right? They're still trying to create that strategic space by having this relationship with us. Um, they're walking a, a, a finer line than other countries have to. Um, it, but it's also interesting because it, it points to this reality, which is that, I mean, I think you and I care a lot about the values dimension, but you can set that aside and you can just do some version of realism. And you still end up in quite a similar place. You end up in a similar place on India, you end up in a very similar place on Vietnam and many of these countries, um, just because of the way they're looking at the China threat, which obviously is much more than simply a, a values-based issue. Yes? Um, one thing that seems to keep you as influence in East Asia is our cultural institutions. Uh, yeah. For example, our universities continue to attract the best and brightest students from East Asia uh, by uh, bothering to this. Uh, do you see uh, Chinese soft power ever reaching uh, the level that the United States has right now, for example, attracting students from Japan, South Korea, mm. to institutions there rather than and it's, it's hard to know. Just be, I don't want to say no just because it's hard to imagine it. Um, I mean, there are country, you know, students around the world learning Chinese. There's this interesting debate in Pakistan about should all Pakistani students start learning Chinese, which has been proposed and is being resisted. Um, I mean, China still doesn't boast a huge number of world-class universities, right? Um, Chinese students till, still flock to the West in vast numbers, which isn't necessarily a vote against China. It's more just a decision to you know, take advantage of what the West has to offer. Um, what do you think is the answer? I mean, do you, can, can China be the West uh, of the university world in 50 years in that sense? Um, well, there, there seems to be something about the culture of China that the West sees thousands of years that keeps uh, certain aspects of innovation um, and curiosity out of uh, Chinese education. that China graduates more engineers a year than the United States graduates students. Um, and so with those sheer numbers, uh, it would seem that at some point, um, Chinese universities will at least attract the best mathematicians, um, the best students of engineering, physics, et cetera, which has real implications for um, military development and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, my dad came from China to study in the US. I don't know. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure, but it, it seems like it could be a real possibility. Yes. So for the continued growth of China and India, how critical do you think it is that they lift some of their billion and a half people in poverty out of poverty? Is that, is that important? Is it really important to have the natural and energy resources to support that? Mm. I mean, obviously it's important. Obviously it's happening, right? Um, it's happened extraordinarily in China. I mean, even in India, the middle class now is larger than the population of the US, so it's happening. Um, and, and this is not simply a story about numbers, but it's also a story about attitudes, about kind of middle class attitudes, which in India we've seen play out in terms of these anti-corruption protests and this great urban middle class outrage at the established institutions, the, the kind of political institutions of the country, um, led by the Congress Party. So. I think this happens and accelerates in both countries. Um, do these people want, do middle class residents of China and India want the same things we do, presumably, for, you know, flat screen TVs and iPads and this sort of thing? Yes. Um, does the world have the resources to supply those? I don't know. Um, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It changes the political determinants as well in India, which I'm more familiar with. Uh, also, they actually have elections in India, so one can actually look at outcomes. Um, uh, again, looking at this Anna Hazar, these anti-corruption protests, 
the Congress Party, which rules India, has had this strategy of basically using rural vote banks, rural welfare schemes, targeting its political outreach to the vast agricultural heartland of India, right? Um, a lot of urban middle class Indians do not support the Congress Party because they feel like middle class interests are discriminated against in favor of the rural poor. This is quite interesting. Which doesn't mean they don't want the rural poor to be uplifted. It means that they want a government that represents the middle class, not peasants, right? Because how do you become a world power in a rich democracy if you're basically if you have a peasant outlook? So what's interesting here is that there's, in, there's this trend within Indian politics of kind of a Congress party establishment that is still really connected to the rural poor, but that doesn't particularly have a huge interest in actually lifting them into the middle class because that would change its political base versus this growing middle class that's being produced just, just organically by economic growth uh, that is not part of that constituency. Yes? Right, G good question. I mean, there's a limit to what we can do. We can, I would say the, the thing we have the most ability to control is trying to push India to get the bureaucracy out of the way. By signing a bilateral investment treaty, we've, which we want to do, which we haven't done, we've been pushing India to lift these restrictions on retail so that Walmart and places like that can just go sell to Indians, which would reduce food prices for Indians, which are a huge political issue. Um, uh, ideally, you get to a point where you can do a proper, full, comprehensive economic agreement with India that affects trade as well as investment. And so what you're doing is trying to roll back the state in ways that don't necessarily improve. I mean, it does, that's not a direct investment in the bureaucracy. It's just saying, let's clear some space for these market forces to, to thrive. Yes? I'm largely in agreement with you on the tensions of alliance between U.S. and India, but there's a couple of nuances. I lived there from 97 to just as the reforms were starting to take off, but nobody really knew what they meant. And the two nuances are that I would bring up is that their form of democracy is a little bit closer to European than American, and they tend to see that linkage and, and value it very much. So I'm not sure how much it will incline them towards us in a political sense. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is that the trajectory across that 10 years is phenomenal and something which most people in the West aren't aware of. When I was there, there was maybe 20 functioning ATMs in the country. And the, the fact that they've achieved that kind of change within, uh, as you said, a somewhat vibrant and chaotic democracy, mm -hmm. I, the only thing I worry about is that at some point the US may collectively look up and feel threatened. And I don't think they should. Mm -hmm. But the speed at which they were able to have been able to change, if they maintain that, I think they're going to scare a lot of people hmm. instead of having people's minds open to accepting what, what potential is there. Do you mean to scare people in terms of outsourcing and this sort of thing? No, or do you mean well, in a kind of, in terms of a more strategic of sense? Their ability to outpace and to, and to respond to external or internal pressure so much faster than maybe as you were alluding to that our house isn't really in order at the point where we can respond to change in the same way that they have done up to now. Yeah. And if they continue that trajectory, people may think they're going to blow us out of the water and, and they won't react properly yeah. to the opportunity. Still a lot of catching up to do. I mean, I'm, I'm with you in the optimism. But that's a, it's still a long way away, right? Right. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. They being oh, countries in Asia? Dan, we've got time for this, and just to take one more question. Okay. So how about you take one more to answer? Oh, yeah, OK. One. So, so one Last one. one. Yes, yes. Uh, regardless of all these, these other factors, if Chinese people aren't able to turn their lights on, uh, obviously they can't succeed. So I was wondering, uh, with their growing powers and their changing interests, how might China carry themselves in South American countries and really 
burden sharing. We would like all of our friends to do a lot more. I mean, part of what we've been trying to do is propel India, including in terms of its military capabilities, to do a lot more in terms of Indian Ocean sea lane security, policing against piracy, uh, guarding shipping lanes, this sort of thing. Um, we, we like this idea of these countries stepping out, I mean, Japan included, right? We used to have a deal with Japan where the whole point of the alliance was for Japan not to have to step out, effectively just to be a passive player. So we were legally committed, legally bound to defend Japan, but it was never legally bound to defend the United States if we were attacked. Um, we want something quite different from Japan now, which is a country that, that is a regional security provider and a global security provider. And you saw this over the past decade. We really pushed Japan's boots on the ground in Iraq with non-combatant forces. Uh, before that, uh, uh, resupp resupplying Indian Ocean ships headed to Afghanistan, operating in the Afghan theater of war in terms of resupply and that sort of thing. So um, this would be true across the board. A lot of these countries, when you get to kind of the Indonesias of the world, they have much less capacity. But Japan and India clearly do. And part of the answer, going back to the size of the fleet and that kind of thing, is to think about, well, gosh, um, so our fleet's the size it was almost in World War I. But throw in the Indian Navy, uh, which intends, I don't know if they will, but they intend to have four aircraft carrier battle groups in 15 years. Throw in the Japanese Navy, which, by the way, is four times the size of Great Britain's Royal Navy. And suddenly, you're looking at some real numbers. And that's why this US-Japan trilateral that's having its first meeting in two weeks is quite <coughs> interesting. Um, because you're looking at a very different count in terms of the fleet, in terms of who's providing security where, if we're not doing all this stuff alone. We're quite used to doing it alone, but we're at a point where we can't really anymore. On, on China and the resource question, so I lived in Bogota, Colombia. And while I was there, um, there were some American kids from the embassy who were going to the local Colombian academy, which taught in English, which was quite splendid, where all the Colombian rich kids went in Bogota. And um, so during their, they had their spring drama, and they were doing a Chinese opera including all these American kids and these Colombian kids. And I was like, well, that's interesting. How did you choose to do a Chinese, a Chinese opera? How did you choose to do that? Well, the Chinese embassy paid for all of these very lavish silk uniforms and this amazing kind of stage setup that was imported from China and you know, made a nice contribution to the school on top of that. Um, and that's very much about China is Colombia's biggest coal export market. Uh, Colombia is developing quite a lot of oil now as Venezuelan oil capacity declines, the refining capacity declines. And so the you know, Chinese being quite smart, the Chinese DCM, the number two at the embassy, uh, who I used to meet there, uh, had been in Latin America for 30 years on various postings and spoke better Spanish than anyone I had met. I just thought, wow, if these guys really remain serious this way, you know, they're really, they're really a player. Um, and that's OK. I mean, there's no rule that you know, Western companies can get contracts in Latin America, but Chinese can't. But there is this pushback you see in parts of Latin America and parts of Africa about the rules of the game that Chinese investors bring to infrastructure projects, to resource extraction. Um, the last thing I'll say is it's just in Australia, in Western Australia, where the economy is on fire. It's just really hot. You have truck drivers and welders being paid three, four $400,000 a year working in and around the mines. All of that iron ore, all of those minerals being sold straight to China in a kind of extractive way. Um, that's great, I guess, except that that doesn't last forever, and that's only 10% of the Australian economy. And the other 90% is being hollowed out because the value of the Australian dollar has gotten so high because of this great Chinese demand for Australian dollars to buy Australian minerals. So there's, there's a degree of wariness about how far this goes. So I do think you see pushback. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.